Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Monica Turner. She's a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology. She's going to be talking with us about the uncertain future of Yellowstone in a warmer world with more fire. She was born in Astoria in Queens in New York City, and she went to high school at Maria Regina High School in Uniondale, New York on Long Island. I don't know how that G slips in there like that, but it's amazing. She also went to college at Fordham University, which I believe is on Long Island. Where is it? Where is it? It's in the Bronx. I stand corrected. She studied biology, and then she went to the University of Georgia to get her PhD in ecology. Then she spent seven years as a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And in 1994, low these 25 years ago, she came to UW-Madison. Uh, when she came here, it was called the Department of Zoology. In the last couple of years, they changed the name. Now it's the Department of Integrative Biology. Uh, this is a pretty cool thing. Uh, many of us can remember 1988. There wasn't a whole lot of rain in the summer of 1988. And that was tough for us here in the Midwest. But the other big story was night after night after night on the nightly news watching Yellowstone burn, and it was a pretty tough thing to watch. Um, and Monica, I think, has been studying it ever since. Is that correct? So, would you please join me in welcoming Monica Turner to Wednesday Night at the Lab? Well, thanks, Tom, and thanks everybody for coming out on a lovely evening. It was at least for me to walk down the hill and stuff. A lovely night tonight, so I'm glad to be doing it now and not in the middle of January when we get another polar vortex. But I'm happy to be able to share with you tonight some of the work that we've been doing in uh, Yellowstone and take you on a little bit of an adventure. So at the outset, I also want to just acknowledge that many of my graduate students and postdocs and collaborators have participated in this work over the years, and we've had funding from uh, federal and local sources and uh, lots of acknowledgments to make. It's not just my work. But I think we probably all agree that our national parks are national treasures, and in fact, they're international treasures. If you go to Yellowstone or any of the parks these days, you'll see visitors from all over the world. But these are very special places that preserve elements of our natural and our cu cultural heritage. And I'm going to take you tonight to Greater Yellowstone. So we're up in, I have to use the mouse instead of my pointer. So we're up in the northwest corner of Wyoming in the, in the northern Rocky Mountain region. This view of Yellowstone is looking towards the east from the west over Yellowstone Lake. So you can sort of see the lake in the middle and it's surrounded by lots of mountains all around it. And in fact, this region is one of the largest intact natural landscapes on Earth in the temperate zone. So it's really a very special place. It's centered on Yellowstone National Park, which you can see kind of the big square here in the middle with the, with the lake. Grand Teton Park is right below it. But then in this rest of this light green, that's all greater Yellowstone. So a lot of it is national forest land, some of it's private, much of it is designated wilderness. So we have a really big contiguous area that still contains many of the natural, um, the original elements of the plant and the animal communities. Greater Yellowstone also, for reference, is about half the size of Wisconsin, just to, to, to give us a, a place-based uh, reference. Um, the landscape was also shaped by volcanoes, and if you've heard anything about the supervolcano in Yellowstone endangering your summer vacation, fear not. I don't think we're in danger of that, um, but it has gotten circulated on the internet. But the central part of Yellowstone is the, in the, the uh, purple shading there, is the caldera that was formed by the last major eruption of the volcanoes that were at the base of Yellowstone Lake. Um, there was a small eruption about 150,000 years ago that formed West Thumb, this large lake that's only a little portion of the big lake in Yellowstone. The most recent lava flows were about 70,000 years ago, so the glaciers have come and gone. 
uh, over that time. And it is a place that gets frequent earthquakes, so sometimes you can actually even feel them when you're out there. So all of this volcanic uh, activity and the, the proximity of the magma layer to the surface is one of the reasons Yellowstone is so special. So when we go out there, we really enjoy seeing the geysers. This is Old Faithful in the winter when there's not 15,000 people all around it. It's a pretty nice time to be there. Um, some of my favorites are the ones that are not the ones that get lots and lots of people, but like Grotto Geyser, you have to walk about a mile and a half down. is really beautiful in the upper geyser basin. And of course, all the, the many hot springs with the microbial communities and also very special geothermal features. And of course, beautiful scenery, no matter where you look. So this is looking across in the Grand Tetons. So you know, just a beautiful draw for everyone. And of course, I, I can't neglect the large populations of native animals. And of course, it's not a zoo, so you're not guaranteed to see everything. But um, most times when people are out there, they'll see some of the animals, wolves, um, elk, bear, etc. So lots of things to draw us. But I'm going to be talking tonight about the forests. So the forests are kind of the backbone of Greater Yellowstone. There are different kinds. Most of them are conifers made up of spruces and firs. So these um, trees here up at the higher elevations where it tends to be kind of cool and wet. Lodgepole pine, you can see where it gets its name, big straight stems. Um, that occupies most of the middle elevations of the forest zone. And then down at the lower portion of tree line, we have aspens, which have a lot of uh, bird communities that are, people enjoy seeing, and Douglas fir. So a variety of different forest uh, tree species. And that really does shape the landscape. So if you're up on any of the higher locations, so this on part of Mount Washburn, and you look out across the Yellowstone landscape, mostly what you see is an area of extensive forest. The forests go, this is on the eastern portion of um, Greater Yellowstone, so they extend from the lower elevation river valleys and creek beds all the way up to treeline with a bit of a transition. So that's really what's shaping much of the habitat and much of the structure of that um, landscape. So in the summer of 1988, how many of you might remember hearing all of this on the news all the time? Yeah, so many of you remember that. It was literally on the TV every single night. So the fires were really, really big. And they were burning. They started in um, late June. There was no precipitation, no rain at all for June, July, and into August. And they were finally put out by the snow in September. The firefighting activities were heroic, and they saved many of the structures, like the Old Faithful Inn, which is just one of the most beautiful national park lodges and such. But it was pretty, pretty shocking to, I think, everyone in the country, and certainly to the, to the managers and the scientists. When it was over, these, I, I, I have to remind people that these are not black and white pictures. These are color pictures. But this is what it looked like at the end. So this is from the fall of 1988, after the fires had um, gone through. And it, it really looked like there was almost nothing there. Um, we mentioned the media reports. This is just a snap from one of the New York Times articles. But really, the main message from that summer was that Yellowstone had been destroyed. However. We shall see otherwise. The big fires, when we look at the map, so here's the outline of Yellowstone National Park, here. The red is showing you the outlines, the perimeters of the big 1988 fires. Ultimately, they affected about a third of Yellowstone National Park. So they were, in fact, massive. The photo that I have here is earlier, it's in July, before they were that big, but that's showing those, those pyrocumulus clouds that can be like where the fires can kind of create their own weather, looking across Yellowstone Lake. So why did we have the big fires in 1988? It's because the summer was extremely dry, no rain, and extremely windy. So when I was out there at one point, we couldn't fly in a small plane because the winds were 60 miles an hour. So very much like the conditions that you've heard about on the news for the past two years in California. So the fires in, in uh, Santa Rosa and in Paradise, they were driven by similarly high winds during very extreme drought. Um, I would talk about this after the talk if people have questions, but in Yellowstone, there was not an effect of historical fire suppression because the natural fire regime in that system is infrequent fires that kill the trees. So that's, and we'll talk a little bit more about that 
But even given that, the size and the severity of the fires that summer were really a surprise because we hadn't seen that for decades in the West. So for both park managers and also for all of the scientists involved. But the climate conditions, that dryness, that heat, and the wind are, were really the big driver. Now, I mentioned fire isn't new. It is something that that, that system has lived with for 10,000 years, for thousands of years. And I have enjoyed reading some of the journals of the early explorers, and I'll just have one quote in here from uh, the diary of Nathaniel Pitt Langford, who subsequently became the very first superintendent of Yellowstone. But he was a member of the Washburn Expedition, which was exploring and documenting the region. That's where uh, photographers and Thomas Moran were along to document things. So he talks about breaking camp in the morning, and then traveling along the rocky edge of the Firehole River by the rapids, and then passing thence through a long stretch of fallen timber blackened by fire for about four miles. Now, this is not a picture from that day, but that's probably what it would have looked like when they were going through it. And my long-term collaborator, Bill Rami, has done all the fire history work in Yellowstone with the tree ring analyses. And by knowing the history of that region, Bill has told me, well, that was probably the fire that burned in 1862. So, so we had evidence of fire in the landscape even back then. And since 1988, we've learned a lot about how fire behaves in that landscape. And historically, this is an area that's affected by infrequent and stand replacing fires. And when I say stand replacing fire, it means a high severity fire that kills the trees and then it renews the forest, but they have to come in from baby trees, from little tree seedlings. So they're adapted to recover. The historical interval between fires was between 100 and 300 years over the past 10,000 years. So we know that from work that was done with the paleo record, where you take cores, and, and you've, I think Jack Williams has spoken this uh, lecture series too. But people can, uh, can assess the dates of the charcoal deposition that, that forms in the bottoms of lakes. The fires have been driven by climate because they occur during times in the past when we have warm, dry climate conditions. And there is not a strong effect of fuels in 1988 the fires burned through forests of all ages and all structures. So it didn't matter if it was an open forest or a young forest or an old forest or a dense forest. And in fact, the fires even jumped over the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. So this picture here I took from, from the air. But the fires actually were lofted ahead like burning embers or branches of the trees get caught up in the wind and blown and deposited elsewhere. So often the fire will be spotting is what it's called one to two miles in front of the main burning front. So the wind is really, really driving this. Um, that's just the big driver. So at the end of this, so I was out there in the summer of 88 planning to do something completely different than what happened. And then these fires were burning. And I never did the thing I was going to do with my colleague, but we got started on this. So with these big fires, there were a ton of questions that we had no answers to 30 years ago. So what were the effects of a fire that big and that severe? I mean, we hadn't had them since we've had more modern ecology in the Western US. There was concern that the soils might be sterilized. The fires might have been so hot that nothing was living down in the soils. Would the forests come back? If they were, if they were would it take a long time, or would they come back quickly? And then we know that disturbances can often invite non-native exotic species to come in. And we thought, oh, geez, are we going to end up with weedy non-native species coming in? So there are a ton of questions. And again, this is what it looked like at that time. So one of the things I got to do was go up in a helicopter. So this is me about 30 years ago in my little flight suit. Um, and fly the landscape because we didn't know what fires like this do and this was at the very end of the firefighting activity. And the other thing I'm going to mention is as a scientist when you have something new happen and you're a young scientist you want to get going on it, 
you sometimes rope your friends and family into coming with you. So we call the 1989 field season when we got our first data after the fire friends and family. So like this is me, this is my mom. She was the executive director of one of the Girl Scout councils in New York. She had two weeks of vacation. She was out sampling burn trees. <laughs> this is my husband who was in graduate school at the time. My colleagues' kids, you know. So the, we really did kind of gather everyone up because you, you need data in order to get the funding to do the full on studies. But what did we learn? So from the view over the, from the helicopter, one thing that was really a surprise, and now everyone knows it in terms of within the fire community, but those red blobs that I showed you on the map of the perimeters, it's not just a moonscape everywhere. So the fire really creates this patchwork mosaic or quilt where you have these black areas in the middle where the trees are all killed and the needles and such have been consumed. So it's very black like what I had shown you and, and much of the area looked like that. But there's also these green islands where the fire just by virtue of the wind or the topography, it kind of went around it. So you really have this complex spatial pattern of areas of different size and different burn severities and, and, and the like. So we, were, we actually tested a lot of um, ideas about how that pattern affects what happens to the forest. We were really surprised at how quickly the vegetation recovered. So here's my October of 88. In July of 89, this is, this is my pocket knife, my Swiss Army knife, and here's a little lodgepole pine tree seedling. They were all over in 1989. Now, you wouldn't see them if you were in the car, and if you were hiking, you'd still have to really pay attention because they were really pretty tiny. Um, but they were, they were there that very first year. Two years after, the fly, wildflowers were beautiful. They were just blooming everywhere. And within 15 years, we had just young trees throughout almost all that burned area. So the recovery was really quick, and it was, everything came in very, very quickly. Lodgepole pine, the trees are adapted to seed back in, and I'll show you that in a minute. One of the things that was really a surprise was that the soils did not burn deeply. And so many of the wildflowers and grasses actually survived the fire. So you didn't see that in October because the tops were burned off, but the roots and the rhizomes were still underneath. And so they sprouted up in 1989 just with leaves. They were a little hard to identify sometimes because you didn't have any flowers. And then in 1990, they flowered. And then because those flowers produced seed, in 1991, the seedlings all came in. So we did not have invasive non-native species coming in. The natives were really fast and surprisingly well adapted. To, um, to, to come back. And this is just showing for one of the lupins. You can see that big tough old root. We did a lot of excavating to make sure we had, you know, we could tell the difference between seedlings and things that, that were survivors and sprouting up and all of that. So we have lots of good evidence for that. I mentioned the lodgepole pines. They were really, really abundant. And this is a tree species that's adapted to fire because it produces, it puts its seed in a bank in the tree canopy. So these cones here, we call them serotonous cones, but the tree produces more each year, and the cones remain closed until they get heated as by a fire. And then they open after or during the fire, and they shed their seeds, and the, the, the conditions that the seeds need are just perfect after the fire. Lots of sun, you got no litter, you know, you just got nice soil to grow in, it's perfect conditions. And so as a result, you get very, very fast and very robust recovery of the trees. There's quite a bit of variation, which I could talk about as well, because at the high elevations, we don't have as many of the seed banking versions of lodgepole pine, but nonetheless, at the landscape scale, they're pretty, pr pretty much everywhere. So I would say, after 25 years, so this picture I took in 2013, I think you can't see the fire because of all the trees. So I suspect most visitors who go to Yellowstone, and this is looking across the Madison River, for those of you who might know that area, it's on the west side of the park. All this entire area that you see here, with the exception of like that big guy, that's a survivor, but all of this are young trees that recovered from the 1988 fires, and the, the trees that were killed have now fallen down, so you don't see the snags either. So I think most visitors, unless it's a very recent fire, 
they're pretty oblivious. And the park doesn't even have much about it in the newspaper anymore because it's just not as much of a big deal now as it was for many, many years. So the take home message from 25 years of work in Yellowstone was really that the native plants and the animals are really well adapted even to fires that are as big and severe as those that occurred in 1988. We were just really gobsmacked by the resilience of the system, to be honest. The ecosystem processes like carbon dynamics and nitrogen and all that other stuff, that also recovered quickly. And we, and we, know, we understand this pretty well, so I got to work with National Geographic in their special issue that they did of Yellowstone in March of 2016 to do this little diagram that shows you know, the transition from the forest, I even got them to get those serotonous cones in there, to the, uh, you know, the wildlife coming back, and then to the reestablishment of a young forest. And again, historically, those trees would grow for another 100 years to 300 years before a new fire would come through and hit the system. So it's a cycle of fire and recovery that's well established. However, we are now changing the rules of the game to some degree. So climate is changing and fire regimes are changing. And I say fire regime and I, I meant to define it before, but we, in, in ecology, we call the fire regime the set of frequency, severity, and size. So all of those things that, that characterize how often and where fires occur in an area. So it's not like a political regime. Um, but what we're seeing in the Western United States, and these are data from my colleague, uh, Leroy Westerling, where the green shows you the, where forest is in the Western US, and the black dots show you where there were big fires between 1984 and 2011 is when this was from. This was a, a, an article that was published in Science because it was the first time we had made a good, strong statistical connection between the changes in the climate and the changes in the fire. Because as you know, it takes a long time to, to be able to really extract a clear signal out of noisy, variable data. So we are seeing more large fires. There's more area burned each year. And I think you, you're aware of that just by listening to the radio, watching TV, reading the papers. The increase in fire is associated with warmer temperatures, earlier melting out of the, of the snow in the springtime, and then as a result, fire seasons are longer because they start earlier because things dry out sooner and then they're going through later in the fall, such as in California when they went through December, which was kind of unheard of. So Leroy has, has brought some of this up to date, but this is also just showing you some of the data where the, the, we're starting in 1970 here. This is the number of big fires in the whole West. The red bars are natural lightning ignited fires, which is what's the normal source in places like Yellowstone. It's not human ignitions, it's lightning storms that ignite the fires. And then the horizontal lines here are just showing you the average each decade. So you can just see the steady march up in terms of more big fires that are, are occurring, and, and this does uh, continue. And that increase in the West is mostly from natural fires. So there are human causes, causes of ignition as well but it's mostly the lightning ones. So we're seeing that. And this is in part because those long-term trends are really a response of the fire regime to climate and ignition sources and the vegetation dynamics. So when we think about what you need for a fire, if we start down, you know, when you're lighting a fire in your fireplace, you need some fuel, you have to have oxygen, and you need a source of heat. So that gives you your start or your flame. When we have a fire that's burning in a forest, in any given day, it depends on the weather that day and the topography, is the fire blew, burning upslope faster, downslope slower, and what the fuels are like, how much biomass is there, how much wood. But then over these decadal scales, like we're seeing the changes happening, it's really a response to changes, a lot of it uh, has to do with the changing climate. So we started thinking about what would happen with climate change back 30 years ago because the projections have been there. We just didn't have quite the sophisticated tools that we have now. But um, Bill and I published our first paper in 91 exploring what the consequences of climate change might be for Yellowstone. And at that point, it was a lot of just logical thinking. So if it's warmer and then drier, we would expect to see more fire just because that's the physics of it. 
And we would also expect some of the vegetation to be shuffled around a bit. So if, you need, if you're a plant that needs something cold, you'll probably be at a higher elevation because that's where it's colder. We also did quite a bit of computer modeling early on with several different types of models. And I have the hammer here to say we thought we were hitting it pretty hard. We were taking what we know about the fire regime over the past 10,000 years and said, well, what if we have fires twice as often or three times as often? What would that do or you know, relative to the historical? But we stayed within the bounds of what we knew had happened over the past 10,000 years. We just kind of went to one end or the other. And so the results of that work suggested that we would still have forests that were resilient. They could rebound from the fire, much like we had seen in what I've shown you here. And so thinking through, well, you know, so climate and fire, we know they've changed in the past. We know that from the records that we've seen from tree rings and other things. We know they'll change in the future. We had simulated quite a lot of differences in the fire frequency and size. And in our models, the forest still recovered. And then the giant fires of 1988 were not catastrophic ecologically. The system recovered. So we said, aha, Yellowstone is very well adapted to fires and climate change. And I've given that talk a number of times. Or is it? <laughs> so there are times when things change your perspective. And this is one of them. So I was at a conference on 20 years after the Yellowstone fire, giving one of the keynote talks on the recovery of the fire. And my colleague, Leroy Westerling, was also giving one on the climate change. And so he showed this slide, and it just astonished me. So on the left here is the drought conditions during that summer of 1988 in the West. The redder the color. The, the, the more severe the drought. So you can see this red is centered right on Yellowstone, a bit up in northern Montana as well. And they also had fires that summer as well. So this is 1988, still the most extreme weather conditions in the summer in the instrumental record in Yellowstone, which goes back to the 1800s. When you look at the projection for 2090, it's worse and it's all over. And that's the average conditions. So that level of change was not something we had seriously thought could happen or might happen. So if we had climate like 1988, kind of every summer, what would that mean for the system? How would it change? And, and how does that counter or challenge what we think we understand about the system and the adaptations of the organisms? So we started doing some more work on looking at what this might mean. And I'll just show one of these cartoons where the outline here is that shape of greater Yellowstone. So with Yellowstone in the middle, but all the surrounding areas as well. And each of, the each of these pictures shows a different time period. So the historical, the mid 21st century, and the late century. And the colors tell us is essentially how frequently might fires occur? What would be the interval between them? So in the historical period, it's over 120 years, and that's consistent. By mid-century, it starts dropping a lot. And by late century, it's really, really low. And this is weather conditions based on the weather. So it says that the weather conditions conducive to fire would be happening every 20 years, like conducive to big fires. And by the end of the century, we'd have them almost every 10 years. So very, very different climate than what we now have in the northern Rockies. And the implications for fire are just beyond what folks had really been considering, either in science or management community. So that suggests we would have a novel fire regime for Greater Yellowstone, something different than the system has had since the glaciers retreated 10,000 years ago. So that's pretty profound. Um, years without fire, which were historically common, would become probably very rare. And fire would no longer be limited by climate. Right now, fire, or, or historically, fires have been limited because we just don't have those conditions like 1988 very often. And so most times it's too cool and too wet. So then that led to a whole other thing. Well then, geez, what the heck lies ahead for the system if it's so different potentially in the future than what we thought? So again, we know that a warmer and drier climate would have to increase fire activity. That's just the nature of wildland fires. But a ton of details are, are unresolved that we've been working on. So how many fires? 
how much area would burn? When would we see things happening? Where on the landscape would places be more or less vulnerable? Would we have tipping points where we change the system over to something that's different than what it has been? And again, can our forests recover the way we've seen them recover in the past? So I would also note, and this is work by, um, that Michael Notaro from uh, was UW-Madison led and just came out this year. He did a big detailed analysis on the climate patterns in Yellowstone. And it has already warmed. So this is not projection. This is the actual data for what has the temperature done since 1982 till 2015. So over that window of time, 34 years, we've increased on average by 2.5 degrees centigrade, which is, I know it sounds like a little, but it's actually a lot when you're dealing with daily averages that are averaged all the time. The graphs here show the at, like the zero line is the average temperature over the 34 years, and the blue lines are the ones that are colder than the average, and the red lines going above the zero are the hotter than average. So basically, you can just see the trend heading from cold to hot. And this has happened during the time I've been studying Yellowstone. I mean, this is, this is going on while we're collecting all of our plant data and everything. The snowpack, this is us, the equivalent, the amount of water that's in the snow. Again, zero is the average over the time period, and this is going down. So there's been about a 45% reduction in the winter snowpack in Yellowstone during this time period. So these are not trivial changes in the climate. They can sometimes be hard to see because climate varies from year to year. So it's, we're not always as aware. Um, it's also really challenging as a scientist to figure out what will happen to this system. And there's, there's two main reasons for that. One is even though fires are increasing in their area and the number each year, they're still relatively infrequent and we can't plan them. So I don't know when a big fire will happen and whether it'll be in a place that need, meets the conditions that we would need to test things. So we still have relatively few events to study. And the second thing is these trees take 300 years to reach the end of their lifespan. So things change slowly relative to a scientist or graduate student's career. So then what do we do? I would say we do not put our heads in the sand, even though sometimes I think we're all tempted to when we face these things. But we can use multiple approaches from the sort of the tools that we bring as scientists. So we can do continue long-term studies like tracking the recovery from the 1988 fires. We know that event. We can compare effects of different fires that burned in different conditions in different years. We can conduct experiments to try to understand particulars. And then we can also use computer models to help us sort of put the pieces together. So I'm going to give you some examples of each of these. And we started out by focusing on trying to understand why and how might the system change. And can we, can we kind of figure out what mechanisms might be driving it? We also have been focusing a lot on the regeneration of the trees after fire, because you can't recover a forest if the trees don't establish. So that's, that's just like a bottleneck or a linchpin for the whole fire recovery cycle. So thinking about we've got a warming climate, we've got changes in fire, what does this mean? And thinking through some of the, again, the, the hows and the whys. And I'll walk you through these with pictures. But I'll just overview that, give you an overview first. We know that the supply of seeds is going to be important. So if we, if we have fires occurring again before the trees have put all those seeds in the bank or have enough seeds, what would happen? They might not have enough seeds. If we have more severe fires, maybe we would also reduce the seed supply. If the fires get big and there aren't seeds, the seeds have to disperse from elsewhere. So they could, we could exceed the ability of dispersal to keep up. And then even if you have the seeds there, you got to deal with the climate that you have during your growing season. So I'll touch on the, each of these briefly. So I talked about the serotonous cones, and if the if we the, the trees are, are growing their cones each year, they start producing them and start having quite a lot of them by about 15 years or so. But it takes a while to build these up, and they continue to build up over time. So when we have a long time between fires. We have mature forests like this burning, and we know that they produced in 1988 dense, variable, but lots of young trees following the 1988 fires. 
But what happens then if those young trees burn again? So that's one mechanism by, by which the increased frequency of fire could affect regeneration. Then there's the burn severity. So that's the effect of the fire on the system. So if the cones were present, so even if we had them, would fewer seeds maybe survive the fire? And the reason we think that could be an issue is that when you have young forests burning, you have the young trees. These are about 25-year-old trees here, lodgepole pines growing. And then these are the trees that were killed by the 1988 fires that have fallen down. So you have your young trees with all their live needles that are fuel for the crown fire in very close proximity to all the dead logs that could smolder for a long time. So maybe this would mean that the cones are just down right in the heat of the fire and they might not do so well. I mentioned the seed dispersal. So we have our patches of areas where we know the seeds have to get in. And we have some species like Douglas fir that are shown here that don't produce a bank of seeds. They have to produce cones every single year. And those trees have to get in from having live neighbors. So there are several species that would rely on this. And we also know from the 88 fires that if we had, this is in lower elevation, the arrow is pointing to some surviving Douglas fir trees. And then these little guys are the ones that came in after the fire. And by counting how many they are and how far away they are, we know that you don't get very many if you're about 100 meters or 300 feet away from the live trees. So we have some ideas on how big the patches of forest might be. But then there's also the weather conditions. So we have uh, the possibility that not only is it the conditions during the year of the fire, but it's the conditions of the weather when the trees are trying to grow. So drought during the years after the fire could reduce the ability of trees to regenerate even if you had enough seeds. So there's many different mechanisms. And in part, this is very um, a sensitive phase because mature trees and little seedlings have different limits of tolerance. So if you think about your garden, your well-established plants can handle not being watered every single day. The little seedlings that you put in the ground, you, they, they could die just with a day of really drought conditions. So the same thing is happening for the tree seedlings. So the mature trees can handle a wide range of conditions, but the little seedlings have much more narrow tolerances. So taking the comparative approach, one of my former PhD students studied a variety of different fires in both Greater Yellowstone and also in Glacier National Park up further north. And we looked for high severity fires like you saw in 1988, but they had to be followed by several years of dry or several years of wet conditions because we asked whether or not those conditions made a difference. And we found that yes, they did. So you had fewer trees coming back when the years were dry following the fire. Also on south facing slopes. Remember your moss grows on the north side of the tree because it's wetter. On the south side you're drier in the northern hemisphere. So anything that faces to the south or if you have a south exposure in your house or on your driveway, which is very helpful. Mine is not. Mine is a sloped north driveway. So yeah, the yeah. ice never melts in the winter. Um, so, so we found evidence for this, this mechanism. But then we also did some experiments. So Winslow Hansen, who finished his PhD a year ago in my lab, did a really clever experiment of taking soils in recently burned forests here in, in little cores, planting. They're, they're little. They're, they're actually about this big. And it's kind of heavy. Soil weighs a lot. So it's a lot of lugging to do these experiments. But then planting them in recently burned forests where the trees grow today, so current climate. And then also at places on the landscape where the climate today matches the projection from mid-century. Okay? So we could say, well, now, now they're growing in their real soil condition. And so at that higher elevation where it's today's climate, so that's where they're growing now. We, and we did Douglas fir and purple, lodgepole pine in, in green. But we had the trees regenerate or establish, the seedlings grow. Um, but 70 to 90 percent less in the future climate. And that difference, where you see this green line kind of drop off for the lodgepole pine, it's a difference of only two degrees on average in the soil conditions, soil temperatures. So a little bit of warming made it much less able, uh, made the, the seed seedlings much less able to establish. So that's looking at a bunch of different mechanisms. 
but we're still trying to put the puzzle pieces together and ask how does it all, how do these all interact and how together will they work to shape that landscape into the future. So, two things we do for that. One is you take advantage when nature gives you opportunity. So in 2016, there were fires burning again. This was the year that had the most fire in Yellowstone since 1988, and it never made the news because fires were burning in California, and they were burning in places where people were living in communities, and these were in the wilderness. So, so they were monitored and, and such, but it's not something like these, these would have been unusual 30 years ago, but now it's now not so much. So this is a photo of the Berry Fire between Grand Teton and uh, Yellowstone Park on the road going up there for those of you who might be there. So this is burning in mature forest, but these fires burned some of my old study plots. So they burned a bunch of the younger trees that were regenerating after the 1988 fires and also after some fires that had burned in the summer of 2000. So this is a photo of the park services showing, these are 28 year old trees, kind of like the picture I showed you looking across the Madison River, this is in that vicinity. And this is the, the maple fire burning in the um, regeneration from the 88 fire. Now, one of the things that's surprising here is how uh, conventional wisdom can change. So when I started working in Yellowstone, we were taught that the fires don't burn in the young forests. And I think it's just because they hadn't seen them burning and they didn't have a lot of young forests at the time. But that was sort of conventional wisdom. And when we were resampling our long-term plots of 25 years in 2012 and 2013, we were walking around saying, why would these not burn? They have a ton of fuel and we quantified it and they had as much fuel as a mature forest and it's also close together like I showed you. So indeed, if you get the right weather and ignitions, these will burn. So this is one of my long-term study areas. So this was a photo that I took in July of 2013 when we were doing that resampling of the long-term measurements. And this is roughly the same area in July of 2017, the year after the, the fires had burned. So you can see it's still a bit of a mosaic. You can see some of that pattern, that quilt there. And this is one of our um, rock markers for our plots where it had, the fire had burned right over it. In fact, we had our metal tag in the middle that was kind of melted, but we actually were able to find it. So we mounted a field campaign in 2017. So this photo has several of our undergraduates from UW-Madison and postdocs and graduate students. This time we didn't have to only go the friends and family route had money from NSF, and then we went out, and as we typically do, we are making measurements of the severity of the fire, and we're counting the tree seedlings, and counting the coarse wood, and, and doing all of those things. Occasionally, you run into critters like this in your field plot, and then you just wait. <laughs> you just give, give, give the buffalo some time to meander on his way, but this was in, in one of our field plots. So what we found is that in these short fires, so the, the fires were 16 or 28 years old when in, in, the turn, in between, rather than the 100 to 300. So this is very unusual relative to historical times. We found some areas that look quite normal. So this is a stand replacing fire, meaning that the trees are dead. And in this case, it, it was enough to kill them, but you can see some brown needles here. Didn't consume everything up in the, in the canopy, and well, we've seen that before. We've also saw typical crown fire. So here the fine fuels, the little needles are gone as well. The trees are black and you know, yeah, that's normal. But we also saw that. And that was not anything I had seen before. So we had areas in all of these short interval fires where everything was con consumed, everything. I mean, every log on the ground and every tree, it was just pencil posts left. And so that I had not seen before. So we came up with a new name. We actually published this and called it Crown Fire Plus because we, Crown Fire wasn't quite enough. So you can see also shadows. We call these um, ghost logs, or you see the lighter color going along here on the ground. That's where there had been a dead log on the ground and it was completely combusted in the fire and it sat there and then it leaves a shadow. And you can see the shadow just for about the first year, maybe the second year. So some of these are measurements you have to make very quickly, otherwise you, you don't get a chance to do it. So this happened where we had very dense trees that were skinny. So they, they may be tall, but they're very skinny, very dense. So areas where those uh, lodgepoles had had a lot of seed and it, it generated, germinated just beautifully. 
So those were the places, but not all of them produced this. So we still don't fully understand what was going on. Even talking to the incident commanders and such, we're not 100% sure why we see this. And it's one of the puzzles that we're still working on. But we also found that with those short fires, fire intervals, so not the long time that the system had to recover, on average, it was 77% less regeneration of tree seedlings in the first year, which is the critical year, compared to what had regenerated previously. And those numbers are, are just way low compared to what we had seen in 1989. And again, the first year is really important here because in much of this system, what happens in the first year sets the stage for the next decades to centuries because the trees are coming in right away. They need that seed bed. And so there's not as much continual re recruitment. Um, we also found an effect of the severity. So in areas like this where the trees weren't completely consumed and they still had cones on them, we saw trees regenerate. In areas like this Crown Fire Plus, there was almost nothing in terms of the conifer trees. Um, there's also a bit of, I'm calling it a triple whammy. I don't know if that's really a good word or not, but in these reburns, because if we've lost the seed source, we also have the surrounding forest is also young. So you don't have the same tall, big, mature trees on the outsides of your burned patches that you had following the 88 fires. So you have a less seed source, and then the cones are shorter. They're down to the ground, so when they release seed, you know, they're, not, they're not going very far. So if you have an old forest that burned, this, these lines show you how many meters away we're, we're catching seeds in, in experimental seed traps, and they go pretty far. And if you have very young um, trees at the edge, they only go a couple of meters. So like within 10 feet, you're just not getting any more seed rain. So that's why I'm calling it kind of a triple whammy. And then on top of it, I don't know if there is a such thing as a quadruple whammy, but then there's the climate. So in those short interval fires, the temperatures are hotter than in a long interval fire because the big trees that are standing there dead actually give you some shade. And then we still have the effects of the north and the south and, and flat areas. So one of my other students has done another experiment within these short interval fires. And we're again measuring the um, soil temperature and moisture continuously. And this experiment is still ongoing. And then planting seeds of our, our dominant species and also leaving something empty so we can see if any dispersal comes in so we have controls as well. So this is Tyler planting seeds in these garden flats that have their bottoms taken out and we have all, every little area is labeled so this is in the in Grand Teton. In fact Tyler is out there doing the final measurements on all of these plots right now. Um, and so from the first year, if you look just at the yellow areas here, if you were in a reburn that's short interval and you're on a south facing slope where you're even drier, just no regeneration in any of these areas, no establishment. And we also found no seeds coming in, no new seedlings came in over the past two years as well. So we are seeing support for these different mechanisms. So the last thing I want to touch on is just sort of putting these together as we look towards the future, because these are not the normal conditions that we know and have experienced. So, and I, we can only do, you know, our, sam our sampling and stuff every year, so we are using computer models to explore this. And so we need models that are able to handle new sorts of conditions, and they don't have kind of baked into them relationships that we know exist in the past. So um, working with colleagues who are actually in Vienna, Austria, a colleague who did a sabbatical here in Madison, we're using an, a model that can, can do trees all the way up to whole regions. And it is designed specifically to handle the kinds of questions that we're working with here. And so we have our, our team of um, graduate students. So I've got two of my graduates. Here's Tyler, here's Kristen, Winslow, and my other colleagues. So this is the team of us that's working on this project right now. And we're looking at scenarios. So these are not predictions of what will happen in the year 2039 or 2078. It's saying, if the climate does this, then this is what happens. So it's plausible futures and what would play out under different scenarios. So they're what-if explorations.
and they can help us to identify conditions that we find as a society desirable or undesirable, and then ideally we figure out how to get there. So we are using the um, general circulation models or global climate models. We're using different uh, assumptions for the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. We are then running this through um, state-of-the-art statistical models to generate the fires, simulating the fires on the landscape. And right now, we're doing this for five different sub-landscapes in Yellowstone National Park. Altogether, it's like 600,000 acres or so. It's a pretty big area, and we're trying to, to, to cover the, the range of conditions. And I'm just going to show you one example from Grand Teton. This is some work that Winslow was leading. So this is current forest patterns in Grand Teton. This is Jackson Lake, for those of you who have been down there. The colors are the different tree species I've talked about. So the, the, the dominant green is lodgepole, high elevation spruce and fir, and the Douglas fir and aspen, excuse me, at the lower elevations. So that's what it looks like now. When we run our simulations out to the end of the century, this top line here is the sum of all of the area in forest, and the colors show you which species are dominant. So there is about a 35% decline in the area of forest in Grand Teton by the end of the century. The um, lodgepole pine dominance reduces quite a bit. As the temperature warms, Douglas fir benefits. It, it's, it's in the lower elevation, warmer positions as well. And the high elevation spruce and fir start to decline. So we are now looking at things like what will happen to the old growth forest? Will we get conversion from old to young? Will aspen be able to persist in the landscape? This is a species of interest from a biodiversity standpoint and just an aesthetic one. A lot of people, if you go out there in September and October, everybody wants to see the aspens. And whether or not, what will, if we, if we lose forests, like I said, 35% of the forest could go away, what will it be? Will it be grasslands, meadows? What, what will come in there? So we're working on some of that now. We're also looking, excuse me, at the consequences for some of the wildlife, um, particularly not so much the big ungulates like the elk and the moose and such, but the, the animals that like the, the just some less charismatic, I should say, but that's not really fair because they're pretty charismatic. But things that like young forests, um, the uh, pine marten likes a lot of uh, dense vegetation, the red squirrel likes the old forest, the snowshoe hare has its own requirements. So, so things that require different um, conditions. What will the change in the forest mean for these animals? We're also going to be using imagery, and these are, these are just examples at the moment, but we're going to be taking our model projections and taking scenic vistas of Yellowstone, and based on what we project in the future with different CO2 pathways, adjust that photo to show what it would look like in the future as a way to try to convey to people how the landscape may change if we stick with business as usual or if we make some modifications societally. And then to give you an idea of some of what this might look like, we're also doing some um, visualizations. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time what you'll see before I run this. So here's, you're, you now are familiar with the shape, the outline of Greater Yellowstone. So that's we're looking up to the north. And I'm going to run a simulation where you will see red areas appear where fires burn. The colors are our different tree species. And if it's a black that comes in, it means the forest doesn't recover within 25 years after the fire. So we're giving it plenty of time to see whether trees grow up and fill in. And then on the graph, you will see a red line showing fire and a black line showing the areas that don't come back. It's going to work at the same time. So here we go. So we're starting in 2006, and we're running to 2100 with the fires. And then in the simulation, we stop the fire just to make sure we're allowing for tree regeneration to happen. So you can see lots of fires occurring throughout the forested areas of the landscape. So, and interestingly, so this, um, and this was, I couldn't make, I didn't make this larger, I'm sorry. This goes up to 30% of the area right there. So we end up with a little bit over 30% of the forested area not coming back as forest. 
So this is just one illustration, and so we're exploring a range of them. Um, but this is the type of thing that we're doing by putting together into a process-based model what we have now learned about the mechanisms. So you'll have to stay tuned, and maybe in two years I'll come back. So our question is, is Yellowstone transitioning, and if so, how? So are we living through and visiting Yellowstone and observing a landscape in transition from this that we've seen in the past with the old forests and the robust recovery to fires to something in which the landscape may be much more open in the future, um, where we have more grassland and meadow and steppe communities and, and less forest. So I think I'll leave you with two messages. One is that Yellowstone will change with warming, and it will change with more fire. Um, just the, 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 just the, the, the logical consequences are less forested area, more grasslands and meadows, less old forests because they're not going to have as much time to recover and grow old again. Some of the old forests are three and 400 years old. We'll see more young forest on the landscape. The forest is likely to be patchier because there'll be places where the fires are still, or fire, the forest is still protected. Maybe it's in a ravine or it's in particular locations. So it's not like forest will go away completely. And our native species are still going to be there. We'll have winners and losers. We're trying to figure out how they'll be recovering. But it's one of the ways that we can learn a lot about how nature can adapt to these changes. The data that we now have from the past is not going to let us to predict the future. And we can't say, based on what happened in the past 10,000 years, this is what's going to happen next. But it is now giving us a benchmark against which we can assess um, the changes that we are recording now. So I started out by saying national parks are national treasures. And I also want to hope that I leave you with the message that they're also scientific treasures, because they're amongst our best living laboratories, where there isn't a lot of management or other um, things that humans are doing. So we learned how an, an intact system um, can respond. And they're giving us, I hope, tremendous insights into the future of those forest landscapes. So I thank you very much for coming out on a weekday night to, to listen to some science. And I hope you have taken something from this. And maybe the next time you go to Yellowstone, you'll be thinking a little bit more about how, even though you're looking in a landscape that looks kind of like it's always been this way, it's not. It's in the middle of changing. So thank you very much. Happy to answer questions if people have them. Yes, sir. I have a question. We drove into Yellowstone in 2014 from the northeast, and there were vast areas of totally dead trees. It reminded me of the Cascades in Oregon, where some bug is causing this. And is that true also in Yellowstone? Okay. So the question is, and I'm repeating it because of the microphone, that because it's, it's streaming. So the question is, um, coming in from the northeast part of Yellowstone, you can see vast areas of dead trees. Looks a lot like the Cascades in Oregon, where there's been bugs eating the trees and killing the trees. And is that similar to what's going on in Yellowstone? So yes and no. So the, there are native bark beetle species, and we've worked on those a lot as well. So the mountain pine beetle is one that attacks the pine trees, the so lodgepole pine and also white bark pine. There's another beetle for the Douglas fir and another beetle for the spruce. They're very host specific. There was an outbreak, and they're native species as well. So they go through cycles where they go up and down. There was an outbreak in the early 2000s. It ended at about 2011. Where you came in is high elevation. You're coming in over the Beartooth Pass, and white bark pine is the high elevation pine there. White bark pine is another climate change um, story because it's high elevation and it's typically in climates where the beetle can't survive. The beetle doesn't like it if you go down to minus 40 for like five days in a row, and that almost always happens. As the climate has warmed, that pressure has been relaxed and the white bark pine is not as able to defend itself. So the, the lodgepoles are better at pitching it out, it gets its resin and it tries to kill the beetle. And the white barks are less defended. So you came in through an area where there's a lot of white bark pine, and yes, they were killed by beetles, some of them. The other thing, though, that you have seen there is that there are trees still standing that kill, were killed in the 1988 fires. And I'm not sure why some of the trees at high elevations seem to stand longer. 
But there are places, mostly at high elevation, where 30 years later, the snags are still standing. So as you come into Cook City and Silvergate in that area, that's still 88 fire. So sorry, I gave you a very long answer to that question. But interesting one, and, and it ties into the climate change story because there's other dimensions to that besides the fire. Yes? What's your best guess for which animal species might be better adapted to a uh, warming climate versus others that may be less successful? So moose may, oh, I'll repeat the question. So um, what would be my assessment of some of the animals that might be well adapted to the warming climate or not the warming climate? So the moose, I think, are struggling with the warming temperatures already. That's part of what's contributing from what I've been, I've been told by the wildlife biologists. And the parasite load has also increased with the warming. So they're having a trouble with that. And um, so I think the moose population may continue to decline. The bear population may also suffer, particularly the grizzly bears, because they rely on the white bark pine seeds in the fall as a food source to beef up before hibernation. And so they're, they're also generalists, however, and so they're fairly flexible in their diet. They eat a lot of moth larvae, too, which I only learned recently. So, but I think that they may suffer from some of the, the loss of food supply. Um, and, and so I think that's a problem. I think some of the ungulates might be happy. So the elk and the deer, um, they might do well because they have to migrate out of those high elevation and deep snow areas in the severe winters. And so if we have more openings and more patchy areas, I think elk and deer and possibly pronghorn might do well also. Now, and again, I should say this, this is me just speculating because I'm I'm not, I'm not a wildlifer. Yes? After the 88 fire, wasn't there great criticism of the National Park Service for not doing more fire suppression? And if you answer that and then talk about what they, how they feel today about fire suppression. Yes. So the question is, during the 88 fires and after it, the Park Service was criticized for not doing enough fire suppression. And then what, is, what has the uh, policy or the attitude or perception been? So yeah, they were really criticized afterwards. And it was um, because there was misunderstanding about historical fire suppression, allowing fuels to build up, and then also that they just you know, didn't do enough. That's actually not true. They suppressed the fires very quickly that summer. They attempted to, but the fire conditions were so far out of firefighting capacity that it's, it was completely impossible to do. Um, they were, however, soundly criticized, and so they, the Park Service put into place a service-wide full fire suppression policy after 1988, and that stayed in place till 1992, and then it was relaxed and gone back to a natural, wild, managed wildland fire policy. The assessments that were done in the following year, so there were blue ribbon panels to deal with the policy side and blue ribbon panels to deal with the science and what the consequences were, and essentially, their, their policy was um, vindicated and you know, supported by the scientific evidence. And so um, that has come back. And now they uh, will suppress fires still when they are jeopardizing infrastructure or if any people are in danger or things like that. But these, these 2016 fires, they were monitored. They did a little backburning of the Maple Fire near West Yellowstone because the town was of course reasonably frightened that what if the fire winds changed, would they burn? So they were monitoring there, but basically they monitor and predict the behavior of the fire every single day and then make decisions about where it might go and where they need to suppress. So it's not a hands-off policy completely at all, but it is trying to let fire have its natural role to the degree it can. One of my recent visits, I remember uh, seeing signs on the road that this was a fire head and that, there, that it was a, and I didn't call it a controlled burn, but allowed to burn. I don't know. Yes. Did, yeah, like they'll, so when you, if you're driving in while a fire is burning, you can see signs on the road that will alert you to the fact that there is a wildland fire burning and that fire is a natural part of the ecosystem and don't panic, basically. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, we've always sort of thought of national parks as being areas where people like nature. Mm -hmm. do its thing without a lot of it. But as we move into the 
climate change environment, might we see a future where we have to manage the national parks to the habitat that we, we want, mm -hmm. as opposed to what we think is being more attacked? And do, do you see that happening or something like that? So the question is, we've, we've managed the national parks as a hands-off arrangement where we can let nature take its course, and as the climate is changing and, and we're seeing these rapid changes, might we have to be managing for desirable conditions? So um, yeah, I've thought about that a lot, and I am personally would not like to see us manage within the national park areas. I think we should do it in the national forests, which are designed for multiple use and their commodity lands and things like that. I, based on the number of surprises we've learned from how the natural system uh, responds without our management, I think we may still have a lot to learn on the advantageous side from um, having areas where we do maintain that hands-off policy. So in a place like greater, greater Yellowstone, I would love to see Yellowstone Park proper and Grand Teton Park proper hands off so that we can see how the native species respond. Um, you know, there's selection happening for things that are more drought tolerant and, and the like. But maybe on the national forest lands, if you really want to maintain timber, then perhaps you start thinking about what species to plant and, and allow ponderosa pine, for example, which is a southwestern species. It's probably well adapted to the new climate but I would, I would want us to do it there and not in the wilderness. But there are differences of opinion on that. It's a, it, I think it's going to be very much a policy discussion as, as things continue to proceed. Yeah. Yes? Are, is there going to be, in my mind, it's impossible to manage it to keep it the way it is if the climate has changed? Mm -hmm. Because it's just that. Um, are, is there going to be some pressure to try and do that? So the question is, um, it's hard to manage it, to keep it the way it is when the climate is changing, and will there be pressure to, to do that? I don't think that there will be pressure to keep it in a fixed, static state, um, because that, there's been a, that, that was the case back, I would say, even in the 60s and 70s when we were man managing national parks. They were viewed as vignettes of America. And we didn't, I say, the, and this is a royal we, we didn't really have as much understanding of how dynamic natural systems were and the role of disturbances like hurricanes and floods and fires and the like and the fact that these systems change a lot. So that has actually been accommodated now in the management of the parks and in the policies that are guiding that. So I don't think there'll be pressure to keep it as a fixed thing because we can't do that. But I think if we start seeing really, really, really big changes, maybe there will be pressure to, to plant things or something. I really don't know. I feel like we're, we're so into, we're heading into such uncharted territory now. Um, I'm not sure. Yes? Um, you work for a department that used to be a department of zoology. I'm <laughs> a plant person, and I'm astonished that your research is almost all on plants, and that you were in a department of zoology. <laughs> um, usually it's the other way around. How did this come to be? Oh, that's a funny question. So the, que the question is, I've been in the Department of Zoology for 23 years until we changed our name to 25 years, but I work a lot on plants, and how could that be? So the University of Wisconsin has departmental names that go back to the 1800s, and inertia is, is a powerful force, especially in universities. And so... Um, I was hired because they were looking for broad-scale landscape ecologists. So landscape ecology meaning looking at spatial patterns and doing big things. And our department has not been only animal focused for the entire 25 years I've been here. So we're very much more like a biology department and have been, in fact, a professor whose position I think I replaced also worked mostly on plants. And so it's a function of Wisconsin having um, very low boundaries between our departments and what we collaborate on. So the people that do work similar to mine, excuse me, would be in many different departments. I could have been, in fact, I used to sometimes get mail to forestry or to botany. Um, but we could be forestry, wildlife, soils, geography, botany, zoology, and the list goes on. So. We mostly don't pay a lot of attention to the name of our department, other than for our teaching and our academic home and stuff. But in terms of our research, we really, it doesn't limit us. Thank you. <laughs>
Yes. I just read something. I don't know the truth of it, but the, but but, it, it, but there's been a, a, a report that at least for protection of the palace of uh, the paradise areas in down, down California, mm -hmm. that someone has developed a gel that they can apply to forest areas that will that will prevent uh, uh, fires from taking hold. Do you know anything about that? And, Supposedly, it's environmentally safe. I can't believe it is. <laughs> it's just like gel that just coats things, and it, and it limits limits the the potential for fires. Interesting. So the question is. There is a report of there being a gel that you can apply to trees or to a forest that would prevent forests or pre prevent the burning. And had I heard of it, and I have not heard of it. Um, but that said, I think there's quite a lot of work going on right now for how to protect the communities that are located in areas that burn. Because that's another topic I didn't touch on tonight. But we have had so much more development of homes and infrastructure because they're such beautiful places, and we can telecommute and things like that now. So we've had a tremendous amount of increase in, in homes in areas that will burn, and that's at the same time that we're seeing the changes in the climate that make them even more likely to burn. And so figuring out the ways to protect places like paradise, I mean, that was just, just terribly tragic. Although if you look at the pictures, the trees are still there and the houses are burned down. So we also have to remember that the homes are fuels as well. So there's a lot of work going on to how to make your structure less burnable, how to manage what's called defensible space around your home, and then at the community level, it's easier for the firefighters to defend a clustered development than if everyone has houses that are on 10 acres. Um, but that's a, a very active area of both policy management and science at the moment. And I'm sure there's gonna be some technical sorts of of approaches that will be tried, as well as reducing fuels and, and things like that. And there's like this balance, you know, people don't want to live in a parking lot. I mean, if we made it all like a Walmart parking lot, there wouldn't be a fire, but no one wants their house there or their communities. So it's figuring out how to, how to make that balance and, and protect life and infrastructure. So if you happen to hear more, please feel free to email me or let me know. Yes, that was today. Yeah, so there's there's like two and a half million people, I think, without power. Yeah, and that's the, yeah, and I understand why they're doing that because when they get those winds, I don't. They didn't say Santa Ana winds. They said the winds were coming from the north, and they're blowing at thirty to forty miles an hour consistently. And so if the trees blow over and they land on the power lines, and the power lines spark a fire, and you have the dry, the drought conditions and the wind you will have fires. And so I think based on their liability over the past, the Santa Rosa and Paradise, they're making that choice. So these are examples of, of kind of difficult choices that we're facing, I think, as a society. You yes? You mentioned Santa Rosa. I was there two Thanksgivings ago, and I was astonished. I couldn't figure out where the fire came from because it seemed like open, I mean, not a huge amount of forest right around Santa Rosa, California. Can you tell me more about what, where that fire started and how it blew through this neighborhood? And yeah, so the question is, in Santa Rosa, um, when being out there, it didn't look like there was a lot of forest around it, and can I explain where the fire came from? And I cannot. Okay. I'm sorry, I, d I don't know enough about the, the California situation in terms of that level of, of detail. I mean, I know they also burned through vineyards. You know, so we're not talking a forest, we're talking vines, you know, growing along. <laughs> Um, fence rows. So, but again, you know, when you have really severe burning conditions, grasslands will burn. They won't stop a fire. They'll make it easier to control the fire, but they won't stop it. Yes? I had heard, I had heard that some of the California fires were actually brushy and grass areas rather than forests. Mm -hmm. So they can't say it's just the forest burning. Yes. So the. the, the have huge fires in the plain states. Yes. Yes. So the observation is in California, some of the fires are brushy and grassy, so you can't just say it's forest fires. And then the final point, that the plains, I mean, the grasslands have had fire, just like Wisconsin and our prairies and savannas had fire routinely in the past. So it's one of the, it's one of the questions I have also about you know, the, the attempt to control the fuels in the forests. 
that's fine, but grasses will burn and carry a fire as well. So we have to be taking a much more holistic view, and it's not just about the trees. But the trees give you the biggest energy release. So you get the, you know, like the 200 foot flame heights and all of that, and you don't get as much from the grass. <laughs> right? Yes, sir. How frequently do you make it out to Yellowstone? Ha! Huh. How frequently do I make it out to Yellowstone? So it depends a little bit on exactly what we're doing and what my grant funding is like. But I usually am out for part of every summer. So it can be, this year it was only two weeks because my, I had PhD students with projects underway and I didn't have anything new to do. But in 2017, when we were doing all of our resampling, it was for a full month. 2012 and 2013, it was a full month. So pretty much every summer, and it's sometimes six weeks was usually my longest and two weeks is about my shortest. And then sometimes in the fall and the winter and the spring, also depending on <laughs> specific projects. Yes, in the back. I wonder if you looked at any genetic changes in the ecosystems that you've studied. So the question is, have I looked at any genetic changes in the ecosystems that I've studied? And the answer is yes. We worked on the genetics of the aspen trees um, because I mentioned that that's a, a species of interest in Yellowstone. And one of the surprises that I didn't talk about in my talk was that um, another bit of conventional wisdom is that in the northern Rocky Mountains, including Yellowstone, that aspens had not reproduced by seed since the glaciers left. So aspens, you know, they re-sprout, and the conditions are not very hospitable out there. So the notion is that all of those clones were there, you know, the, the, the trunks are young, but the individuals have been there for thousands of years. So in 1989, we found little, little green things, and we thought they were an, a wildflower. And then the next year, in 1990, they had wood on the base. And we're like, what are these? So we keyed them out, and they keyed out to be aspen. And we're like, well, no, that can't be, because that doesn't happen. And we keyed them out again, and they were still aspen. And, <laughs> and in fact, what we saw is that, um, that aspens established in the burned forests only from seed in 1989. So it's an example of how these natural populations respond to disturbance. So it allowed aspen actually to move upslope because that's the only time it can move. It's, if, once it's a big tree, it's not like an animal that can run away. So it, it moves as a seed. But going back to the genetics, so this is where this comes in, is that we did work on the genetics to see what was the genetic diversity of the seedling population. Was it related to the adults that were nearby in, in, in Yellowstone? And um, we found that it was quite diverse, and it was related to a lot of the trees that were in the southwest, because that's the dominant wind direction. So it wasn't always related to the populations that were locally in Yellowstone proper, but it it did come through on the southwest. And aspens release their seeds really um, late in the winter, early in the spring, and the seeds can travel over the snow really long distances. And so we actually had to fly over Yellowstone to make sure in the fall that we could map every small little aspen adult to find them. And then we discovered that in the burned forest, they went as far as 16 kilometers away from the nearest known adult. So they got around. And then, um, the sad part on the genetics is that with Rick Lindroth, who does, he's an entomology, does a lot of the aspen genetics, we tried three or four times to get proposals funded to like do the next thing, and we never were successful. So after that, no more. Yes? I noticed on the one map you had there, uh, we were showing an expansion of the uh, climate change area that went sort of northwest and southeast. Does it seem that Yellowstone is the center hotspot for the whole system? So even if it would not necessarily where you could predict it where it was getting worse, does that mm -hmm. show that, oh yeah, it's still going to be really bad in the Yellowstone area? So, you, are, are you, so the question is on the maps, I had some that showed it centered on Yellowstone and then throughout the whole and area from there, and okay. expanding. So yes, it does show that it will be still bad in Yellowstone and pretty much the rest of the area as well. Um, we are, we're also doing some work up in Glacier, and they've also had a lot of fire. It doesn't get a lot of um, press either. I'm not quite sure why, but I think they've almost had more as a proportion of their park 
than has Yellowstone. And that's another area where we're seeing that intensification of the hot, dry conditions. So I don't know if I've answered your question yes. adequately. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Is your work affected uh, in any way by the present political climate? Mm -hmm. So the question is, is my work affected by the current political climate, given that it touches on climate change and sensitive issues in current politics, and I'm also getting federal funding. So it has affected the funding streams to some degree. So there is a program called the Joint Fire Science Program, which Congress put together in the 90s, I believe, from Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, and so a number of the agencies pooling their funds together to focus on fire because it was becoming an issue. And that has been a source of, it's competitive grants, but that has been a source of, of funding for several of my projects in Yellowstone. And their funding was almost zeroed out for the past several budgets. And so there has been no additional funding in that area that at all. appropriations, not just the Trump administration budget, but the actual appropriations. Yeah, actual appropriations. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, because the, the actual appropriations restored what had been zero. So, so there's some money there. There's some money there. They're, they're running, they're basically keeping some of their um, information networks going okay. and running a competition for graduate student, small grants for graduate students uh, only. Um, in terms of the science that I do, I would say it does not affect what I do. Um, we still are able to follow the, the questions that we want to do. I mean, I've done program reviews under past, not this administration, but others, where there has been um, you know, word coming down from on high within the Forest Service that they weren't allowed to work on climate change. That was previous administration. But the, a lot of times the science is still getting done, even within the agencies. It's just sometimes put under a different name. <laughs> Um, for, for academic scientists, it's more that if we lose our support for science funding in general, we're going to lose our ability to gain all of this knowledge. And I feel like we're still fighting a battle at a higher level for just the value of research and the value of learning and then evidence-based policy decisions. Yes? Um, I go to the Boundary Waters a lot, and I think starting in 1995 or 96, Quetico and then the Boundary Waters on the west side, there's been a series of pretty devastating fires. Mm -hmm. Do you have colleagues that to talk to that compare what you're finding in Yellowstone to what folks are finding in Minnesota? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what are they finding? Yeah, so the question is, um, if, you, if you go up to the Boundary Waters in Quetico, you can see evidence of the fires up there. So yeah, it's super interesting. Um, one of my colleagues at the University of Minnesota, Lee Frelick, uh, is one of the people that does a lot of the work up there. And with the Boundary Waters, they have also found sort of the, the sequence of events that happens has a really strong impact on what the forest does afterwards. So they are also seeing differences in how things are changing because in their case, I'm trying to remember, but I'd have to go back and look at the details, but you can, you can convert something to jack pine, or you can come back as a deciduous, or you can, they, depending on if you have the wind throw, like the 1999 4th of July storm, that straight line storm, if you burn after that, you didn't have a seed source, and then you go one direction. And so, there's, so, so the answer is yes, there is a lot going on. And yes, there's a lot of comparison that gets done between uh, different kinds of disturbances and what we're seeing at a general level in different places and what's similar and what's not. The, in a lot of places there's hardly any soil there because the Canadian Shield is right there. Mm -hmm. What is the soil like in Yellowstone? You, you showed your student mm -hmm. I mean, soil cores, I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. So the question is what is the soil like in Yellowstone? So in the boundary waters you've got the shield and it's really shallow. So in Yellowstone the soils are also very shallow. So they're derived from volcanic parent material. Um, those of you who know anything about rocks and such, it's rhyolite and andesite derived soils for the most part. They're very infertile from the standpoint of a plant. They're quite rocky and they're shallow. 
So they're kind of not a very good place to make a living for most plants, which is why I think lodgepole pine is able, it's very nutrient conservative, it's um, mycorrhizal, so it's got the fungi helping it to obtain um, some of the stored nitrogen that is in the soil. But it's not, um, it's, it's shallow soils and not very high water holding capacity either. Yes? When you talk about the mycorrhizal relationships, what is the depth to which the fungi go and are they able to escape the effects of the fire on the soil? Mm -hmm. So the question is for the mycorrhizae, how far down do the fungi go and can they escape the effects of the fire on the soil? So most of the mycorrhizae are in the top 15 centimeters of the soil. So they're shallow, and lodgepole is a shallowly rooted um, plant. When the fires come through, the fungi are more vulnerable to heat than are the bacteria. So they, and then when their hosts die, they also, their population numbers will also go down. However, the sampling that was done in 1989 found that the um, spores, I think is the right term, were everywhere. And they did survive the fires, and the trees, seedlings that were establishing were almost all colonized in that very first year by the mycorrhizae. So that's one of the questions that we had, too, that we thought, oh, you know, the trees are going to come back, and there's going to be no mycorrhizae. And without that, they will not thrive. But the mycorrhizae were everywhere, and they weren't limiting. Has that mycorrhizal study been repeated in the short return fire areas that burned for 25 years? The question is, has that study been repeated? And it has not. However, I do have a proposal pending <laughs> <laughs> at the National Science Foundation to focus on the nitrogen dynamics. So there's a whole other nutrient cycling side of these stories as well. And we would be out doing that and also looking for some of the end fixers. There's some, I don't want to go too far down a nutrient pathway because usually it puts people to sleep even though it's late. But there's some um, work that's been published out of British Columbia that suggests that there may be some nitrogen fixation capacity in the mycorrhizae. So nitrogen fixation is when you're, like your bean plants and peas where they can grab nitrogen out of the atmosphere and their, their symbiotic bacteria help convert that to a form that the plant can use. Most plants have to take up inorganic nitrogen, like the fertilizer miracle grow that we put on our house plants. So if they can do that, that would be a major change in our understanding. So right now, we do not know how the system gets its nitrogen back, because we don't have enough known nitrogen fixers. Other than the five pounds per acre from lightning, um, on average. Yeah, but when, when you count up how much is the question is ra rather not the five pounds from lightning on average. I don't think it's enough. We don't have enough to account for how much is now in the biomass when we do the budgeting because the trees are growing so fast. And uh, we can estimate about how much. So when the live trees are burning, the, f the foliage and the um, leaf litter on the ground, when that burns up, nitrogen is volatilized and it's emitted to the atmosphere. Yeah, and so somehow the system has to recover that. And we know from analyses we've done with chrono sequences that it recovers it by about 40 to 70 years, but we don't know how. So that's where, so if any of you can have some pull with the NSF panels that are, that are working, I would like to pursue that. Yes? So I'm interested if the nitrogen volatilizes because uh, in my limited experience in the boundary waters when the fires are burning and plus you've got to go to glacier in 2016 when the fires were mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really not just smoky, but dusty. Yep. And if you measure the nitrogen of the dust that falls, do you get particulate nitrogen moving? In other words, can you have yes. nitrogen? So the question is, when you have the nitrogen burning and you get like ash falling down and yeah. dust falling down, are you depositing nitrogen? You are. But that's still kind of within the system. So you know, you're moving it from one place and depositing it in another. Yeah. But then at the end, when you measure how much is there, you still have lost a bunch. But yes, you do get, you do get some tran translocation. Mm -hmm. Yes? You mentioned conifers. Is there anything with deciduous trees in the Yellowstone? 
So the question is, with, I've talked a lot about the conifers, and anything about the deciduous trees. So that's really mostly the aspen story. That's the dominant, it's still not a very dominant one in terms of extent of the landscape, but it's the most prominent one. Um, and there's a little bit of riparian cottonwood along some of the, like especially along the Snake River, but there's not much in the way of deciduous trees. <laughs> 